Uh, Dina, do you see us and hear us? Yes. Okay, you see, you see my back, so I don't know where I should. Oh, I should look here. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to figure that out. Um, are you able to share your slides? Sure. Let Let me share the slides. I, I'll I'll introduce you briefly. I I don't know if you see the room, but we have like a fairly black know. audience. I only see you. <laughs> you only see me. Okay. Can you pan a little bit? So it's a it's a fairly big auditorium now. <laughs> With... Do you see the slides? Yes. So okay. are you ready? And I, I can introduce you. Ready. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, hello everyone. Um, if you can turn the camera off. Uh, hello everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the keynote, the final keynote talk uh, of the day, and. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Dina Katabi. Uh, Dina is a professor uh, at uh, MIT, uh, Electrical and, uh, Engineering and Computer Science Department, where uh, she uh, heads the NET MIT lab, as well as uh, is a co-director of uh, the Wireless Center at MIT. Uh, she's a highly accomplished researcher, is a MacArthur Fellow, has won numerous awards, um, uh, the ACM Prize in Computing, the ACM Grace Hopper Award, uh, as well as several paper, best paper awards, SICOM test of time uh, awards. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, she works broadly in mobile systems, wireless uh, systems, uh, these days more machine learning and IoT systems, uh, and IoT for healthcare. Um, I also have a personal connection with Dina. She was uh, my research uh, supervisor and research advisor over my PhD. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you here uh, with us. Uh, Dina, uh, over to you. Th uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be presenting to you guys. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about health monitoring. And as Juan was mentioning, like my uh, my interest, particularly my interest over the last eight years, have shifted to healthcare and what um, technologies can do to help improve healthcare. And particularly, I work about on new technologies uh, that use particularly wireless signals, machine learning to monitor health. So when I tell people typically that I work on digital health, uh, they think about wearables and they tell me, oh yeah, so wearables are really interesting and they show me the wearables that they might be carrying on them. <coughs> but then I tell them that it's not, like I don't work on wearables, I work on new technologies that are do not require any wearables. And to some extent, uh, they are more like uh, the invisibles. They just disappear into the environment and they can monitor health completely contactless. So let me tell you what I mean by this. Imagine the Wi-Fi box that you have at home and imagine that it is not exactly the same Wi-Fi box, but it is something smarter, smarter uh, wireless box that can sit in the environment and analyze the wireless signals around you to get your sleep, your breathing, uh, your heartbeats, um, your gait, your movement, sleep apnea, would know when you dream, for example, from when you are sleeping in a different sleep stage, and all of that without touching you. So this is exactly what my team at MIT has been working on for the last eight years. And we have developed a wireless box that we call the Emerald Box. It, it looks very much similarly to how your Wi-Fi box looks. However, it is much smarter. And it uses a form of ultra-wideband technology to analyze the electromagnetic waves around you. And from that, it can get your vital signs, your sleep, your gait, your movement, et cetera. So let me uh, just show you a uh, visualization of how that works. So basically, we all know that wireless signals spread in the environment, traverse walls on occlusions. And actually, wireless signals uh, reflect and bounce off the human body because our bodies are full of water. And here you will see an example of a person on the floor. And you can detect it using the wireless signal. And because it bounces off his body and goes back to your device, and you can use a uh, machine learning technology to understand that this is a fall, and then you can convey it back to the caregiver via text, email, or a phone call. 
Now, of course, this is a visualization. So in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to, to take you through this process of how we develop these wireless technology, showing you some of the earlier results and then moving on more towards health. So uh, let me show you one of our experiments. This is uh, an early experiment uh, that here you see uh, one of my students in our offices at MIT. So our device actually is not in this office, it's behind the wall where you see this big arrow is. So we're gonna monitor the movement of this person from behind the wall without any devices on himself. So this red dot that you see here is where the device says this person is standing. Now, as he moves, you see the red dot tracks him. Now, remember that we are tracking him by analyzing the radio signal that bounces off his body and without any wearables on himself and through a wall. He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a wireless sensor or the, any wireless technology. So let me play this video again for you. And you can see that we can track him pretty accurately. And all of that stuff is just without any wearable, just by analyzing the electromagnetic waves as it bounces off his body through a wall. Now, of course, for everything that we do, we compare with uh, the gold standard. And in, in this case, we compare with the Viking motion capture room, which is a room that has uh, a camera, infrared cameras on the ceiling. And in that case, you have to put infrared reflectors on the person and you can track their motion to within one millimeter. And we can see that our tracking is pretty accurate. Uh, it's 98% uh, accuracy in comparison to Viking capture room. Now, of course, if you can get this motion and how the people are moving, there are many applications actually in health. And one of the things that coming from the IT, um, from an IT background, I didn't know is the importance of gate speed, like the speed, the, the natural walking speed that we have and how much it reflects many diseases. So particularly like gate speed, that is the, the, the natural walking speed that you have actually is very important for diseases like Parkinson, Huntington's, multiple sclerosis and drugs. Uh, when, when people pass drugs, for example, for Parkinson, they look at something called the six minute walking test where you have a person walking and the clinician is monitoring their gait speed using uh, a, a watch uh, an alarm, uh, with an alarm. So, but it's also how we walk actually get uh, is a predictor uh, of even diseases or exacerbation of diseases that you don't tend to think of them as diseases that are related to motion, like congestive heart disease and COPD. Uh, so these are pulmonary diseases and heart diseases, but actually, when we when a person has congestive heart disease they slow down they naturally the impact of the disease if they have the exacerbation if they are leading to an exacerbation that affects their walking and instead of like bringing people to the hospital we have it in in the home we can monitor it in the home 24 7. And one thing that I want to mention, this is very different from if you have like Fitbit or an accelerometer, because an accelerometer does not measure walking speed, it just measures the number of steps. And then it multiplies by whatever is the average for your health, for your uh, uh, age and gender. But there are other things that you can know once you have the ability to monitor where people are moving in the home. So basically you can start actually understanding behavioral symptoms. So for example, you can say, okay, so the person is sitting on the TV couch for the whole day, very sedentary. Or you can track how often people get to the kitchen and be able to track their eating behavior or toileting behavior. But when, when we started, again, we started, we come from the wireless community, from the actually computer and uh, mobile computing community. And we started with this motion, like tracking motion. But then we discovered that actually we can use wireless signals to monitor many other health metrics. So what else can we monitor? When you go to sleep, your brain waves change and you enter different stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movements. Or, um, 
And these sleep stages, of course, very important for sleep disorders. In the US, for example, one in every three people have sleep problems. But there are much, there are also important beyond sleep disorders. They are important for a variety of diseases. Because think about somebody who has depression, for example. So one of the common things in depression in this stage, rapid eye movements, which is the stage in which we dream, tend to happen too early in sleep. So, so disruption of, of, in rapid eye movement are typically associated with disruption with diseases like related like to depression, mood disorders, anxiety. And I, mean, I don't have to tell you that we all know that if you are stressed, if you have problems, you typically have problems sleeping. But also particularly it affects REM. Now, deep sleep, this stage, is the stage in which we consolidate memory. So the slow waves during deep sleep are actually related to Alzheimer's disease. So if we can monitor these sleep stages, not just monitor whether somebody is asleep or not, if we can monitor sleep stages, not only we understand sleep, but we can actually have better understanding of variety of diseases. So today, if you want to monitor sleep stages, you send someone to a sleep lab and they put the, uh, these electrodes on their head and body, like the person that you see in, on the slide. So as you can tell, this is very hard to sleep with. You have all of these sensors on your body and also you are sleeping in a sleep lab, like not your usual home. Uh, so when I started working with doctor, I was really very surprised that this is the way we monitor sleep. This is the way we try to understand sleep, which, as you can guess, is not very representative of your sleep. And not only this, you can only do this once or twice, but you cannot bring the person every night to a sleep lab to monitor their sleep and changes in their sleep over time. So let me show you what we do. So this is our device. And it transmits very low power wireless signal, about 1,000 times lower power than Wi-Fi. And it analyzes the reflection using machine learning algorithm, and it can spit out the sleep stages throughout the night. So this graph that you see here on the screen is what's called hypnogram. So on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the, very, the different sleep stages of the person for every 30-second epoch. This is what you get if you go to a sleep lab. And of course, we run a variety of studies on sleep. In fact, we worked with multiple doctors at Mass General Hospital and other places. And uh, we, we show that our mechanism can monitor sleep very accurately. So in particular for this, we use an, a, a machine learning approach neural network. And here I'm just showing you the confusion matrix. So uh, basically what you see, the, the rows are the ground truth uh, stage for every 30 second epoch, and the columns are the, uh, the prediction. And you see from this confusion matrix that the accuracy is pretty high. And remember, this is like we are taking every 30 second epoch and looking at whether it's awake, REM, light sleep, deep sleep. Now you can imagine, I, I also didn't tell you, like when you go to a sleep lab, so what happens at the in the morning, like a sleep technician comes and looks at your signal, and for every 30-second epoch, they try to say, okay, so actually the person is in light sleep, deep sleep, REM, et cetera. So you can imagine this is a very tedious process, but also it's not a perfect process because if you take the same signal from the same person on the same night and give it to two sleep technicians, they are not going to agree completely. In fact, on average, the consistency across sleep technicians on the same data is about 83%. So as you can see here, our accuracy is pretty close to that. In fact, on average, it is about 80% per 30 second intervals. I wanna show you just a representative example so that you can understand what, what is the output of these, uh, these kind of technologies. So here you see uh, an example where we compare our device, we call it the Emerald device, with PSG. PSG is the gold standard. It's really what happens when you go to a sleep lab and put all of these electrodes that I showed you on your head and body.
So you see this person, like you, uh, Emerald is here in blue and uh, PSG in green. And on the x-axis, you see the time. So you see that this person uh, went to bed around zero, which is midnight. And then around, in fact, he didn't fall asleep immediately. It took him about two hours. And around 2 a.m., he, he fell asleep. So he moved from awake to light sleep. And then he stayed in light sleep for about half an hour, and there was some excursion to deep sleep. And then actually he was awake between 2.30 to 3.30 a.m. And then he fell asleep again, and he moved to light sleep, deep sleep, again, light sleep, REM, the stage in which he's, he's dreaming. And now again, we see another sleep cycle. So if each one of these is one sleep cycle, so this is one sleep cycle, second sleep cycle, third sleep cycle, first sleep cycle. And as you can see by looking at the two graphs, they are very similar. In fact, most of the differences are really in these periods where you see like the signal or here the green signal, which is the ground truth goes up and down, up and down, because the sleep technician is not really like, it's not potentially like a change in their mind, like, okay, so now it's light sleep, now it's deep sleep, now it's light sleep, now it's deep sleep. So the machine learning, as you can see, tries to consolidate these, these intervals and make one decision for them. But the whole sleep structure is preserved. And uh, remember, we are doing this without putting any electrodes on people's bodies in the person's own home, and we can do it every night at zero overhead to the person. Uh, what else can we monitor? So this person is sitting like you guys, and he's, uh, what we are seeing on the screen is his inhales and exhales. We ask him to hold his breath. You see the signal stays at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. And again, we compare uh, this to a, an FDA approved breathing belt, which is like if you want to monitor breathing, you today you have to have people wear something called a breathing belt on their chest. And uh, the accuracy is 97% uh, in comparison to this FDA approved mechanism for, for monitoring breathing. And uh, so Again, like what else can we monitor? So uh, let me show you, this is the breathing signal. And uh, what you see here, the inhales, exhales. Uh, one of the things that we were really, uh, at the beginning, we tried, we tried to investigate, you see here some noise on the signal. You see blips on this, wire, on this uh, breathing signal that we got from the wireless device. And uh, at the beginning, we were just, okay, this might be noise, noise, but actually what turned out is that we are able to get the person heartbeat. So these blips on the signal are actually the pulsing of the blood uh, uh, of the person, which are associated with every beat that he has. So, uh, so wireless signals that's surrounding us is very sensitive. It actually, every single, even the smallest movement, like the, the pulsing of your blood, gets imprinted on these electromagnetic waves. And what we do is to analyze these electro electromagnetic waves to try to discover these inverse transforms so that we can get the original signals. Now, I want to tell you a bit how these systems work. Uh, now, of of course, I don't have the time to tell you in a lot of detail, so I'm just going to give you at a, like information at a very high level, and uh, I'm very happy to direct you to the proper paper for every, every specific system. So at a very high level, we all know that if you transmit wireless signal, it traverses walls and occlusions, and it reflects up the human body because, as I said, our bodies are full of water. And some of these minute reflections come back to your receiver. And one of the things that we all know is that distance is equal to the reflection time multiplied by speed of light. So distance is equal to time multiplied by speed. This is like one of the simplest equations that we deal with. Uh, so if we want to, to discover the distance of this person from the device, one of the things that we can do is that we all know the speed of light. So we just need to know the reflection time. And uh, so the question is, how do we measure the reflection time? And this is like a very old question, like this comes from radar system. So uh, there is a technique called FMCW, and let me try to explain this to you. So uh, if you transmit a wireless signal where the frequency of the wireless signal changes linearly with time, then that signal is going to be reflected and the 
shift between the transmitted signal and the reflected signal is the time it took the signal to get reflected. So that is the reflection time. This is what we want to measure. But measuring time directly is very hard because we are talking about picoseconds resolutions here. So, so you want to measure time that is very accurately, but without actually needing to measure picosecond, which is very difficult. But you can see here that there is a linear relation between the change in frequency at any point in time between the transmitted signal and the received signal. And that change of frequency is related to the reflection time using the slope of the signal that you transmitted. So you know the slope, you can measure changes in frequency using Fourier transform, and uh, you can, uh, from that, you can get the reflection time without having to directly measure time. And as I said, this is like one uh, intrinsic technique in radar systems and has been used uh, for many years uh, in radar. So, uh, of course, all of these technology, like trying to understand reflections, we try to use something that is related to radar, but unfortunately, things are not that simple. Uh, so when you are trying to work with these uh, health-related signals that are related to radar, like trying to analyze the signal that bounces, that bounce off people's uh, bodies in indoor environment, things are much more complex than radar. Because, I mean, when you think about radar, like when you transmit a signal to the sky, the sky is empty. So the signal is going to bounce off potentially an airplane there, but there is really not much there other than these, like potentially an airplane. So, so the reflection is easy to analyze. However, what happens if you have indoor environment you have multi-pass reflections. And uh, so basically when you transmit the signal, not only it bounces off the person, it bounces off all the objects in the environment. Even more hard, it bounces off the person and then you get the second degree reflection or indirect reflection. So it can bounce off me, then bounce off the wall and then bounce again off the, the, the closet. And as these, um, these indirect reflection happens, so these indirect reflection also change. They are not static because they involve the person. So when the person move, all the indirect reflection move with him. So instead of having this empty, nice sky to analyze your reflections and just look for the time of reflection, now you have an environment where if you look at the signal power, it's really a mess. So you don't see this nice reflection from the, the, the person. You see a multipass effect, and the person effect can be completely masked by that signal. So the question that we are asking all the time is how can we extract the signal that comes from the human body from this mess? Another thing that you have to, to look at is Particularly, we are not just interested in the in distance. We are interested in many things. Like, for example, I showed you that we can analyze the sleep. So I'm not just interested in, in distance of the person. I want also to get whether they are in light sleep or deep sleep. And that has nothing to do with distance. So how can we do that? How can we address these two uh, essential uh, challenges? So... At the heart of much of what, we, of what we do is to be able to analyze the wireless signal using neural networks, and particularly uh, customized neural networks that operate on RF signals. Now, I'm sure all of you are very much aware of the revolution that deep learning and neural networks have created in um, disciplines like computer vision and NLP. And in those disciplines, you analyze images, you analyze text or audio using neural networks. So what we did is to take this concept, uh, the deep learning and the advances in neural network, but instead of having the input being images, we want these neural networks to operate on radio signals. And from that, to be able to understand and extract the information on radio signals. Now, there are so many differences between operating neural networks on radio signals and operating them on standard modalities like uh, images or text. And um, I, I don't have the time to go all over all this, but I just want to show or I just want to explain one thing that is essential when you try to, to operate neural networks on radio signals. So one of the essential things is that you want your system, your neural network, to generalize to new homes. 
So what does that mean? It means that you are going to take your neural network, you are going to get data from some some domains, some homes, like for example, you train your neural network with let's say David and Barbara and many, many other people. But then you want to take that neural network to a new place, let's say Chris's home, and you want that neural network to work accurately in this new environment. Now, the reason why this is not simple is actually, so sorry, the, the, the domains where you trained are called source domains and the domain where you want to generalize is called target domain. So the reason why this is not very simple is, as, as I told you, radio signals reflect of everything in the environment. So they have information not just about uh, information related to the person or the disease. They have information about everything. And that information is irrelevant to, to for example, sleep or uh, the tasks that you are interested in. So one essential thing when you are working with these kinds of systems to be able to generalize, you have to remove the extraneous information in the signal and that are irrelevant to the task and keep only the information that are relevant to your task. So I'm going to just uh, start with an initial idea about how to do this. This domain uh, of like how to deal with domain shift, how to generalize to new domains and all of that stuff is a very active and large topic. And I'm just going to give some initial ideas uh, in this domain and how to, uh, to adapt the signal. So let's say that you have a, an input signal. In our case, it's radio signal. And you want to encode that signal to generate a representation. We call it E of X. And then that representation, you want to use it to have some prediction. So let's say it's a health metric. Like you want to discover whether the person is in light sleep, deep sleep, uh, REM, et cetera. Now, as we said, this, this representation, E of X, you want it to be free of extraneous information that are irrelevant to your task, that have nothing to do with your task. And you want to keep the information that are related to your task. So how do you do this? Now, one of the approaches in the, this area and the initial approaches in this area is that you have, you add another neural network. Here we call a discriminator. And the job of this third neural network is to uh, ask the question is, where does this data, where does this uh, signal come from? So which home? Is it Alice's home or is it uh, Bob's home, etc.? Now you have these three neural networks, the discriminator, the predictor, and the encoder, and kind of like they are playing a game with each other. And you train the neural network such that over time, the uh, the discriminator will will lose the game. So the your your cost function is uh, the cost of the predictor minus the cost of the discriminator. So eventually the discriminator will lose, which means that when the discriminator loses the game, the discriminator can no longer use information in the representation to detect where the signal comes from, but the predictor can still uh, uh, predict the output metric, like whether the person is asleep or awake, and if they are asleep, whether they are in light sleep or deep sleep, etc. Uh, one issue with this uh, simplistic approach is that the discriminator may also remove not just the extraneous information, but also the useful information. Like you have no guarantee that when the discriminator loses, actually, that the predictor will still be able to predict the health metric, because you are removing the extraneous information here. So we have, uh, we introduced in this particular paper, a new approach at the time that would allow us to ensure that the discriminator uh, cannot remove the, extra the, inf the important information. So we call it the uh, conditional discriminator. And specifically, you can give to the discriminator the, the information about the health metric. Basically, the, you, you give this uh, information that is related to the health, whether the particular person is in sleep stage, uh, light sleep, deep sleep, et cetera. So now, because the discriminator has this information, the training cannot make him lose by removing this important information. Because removing this important information is irrelevant to the discriminator losing the game because he already has it as input. 
And you train your neural network in this way and without getting into a lot of the details, but actually we can prove that the, the conditional discriminator at equilibrium will remove only the extraneous information, but leave the important and useful information for the prediction. So this is just uh, to get you a flavor of uh, some of the challenges that we have to address when we are trying to use a neural network and apply them to RF signal. Now, of course, there are many interesting problems to solve and our more recent paper address uh, these problems and keep improving on them. Uh, just to give you a few things uh, to think about. So, uh, Another challenge is how do you label radio signals? So if you think about machine learning for understanding images or text, typically you have these data sets where you have people, workers, that you give them the image and they tell you the image has cat or has dog or whatever, and you create these labels for your data set. But it is impossible to give a radio signal to someone and say, look, tell me whether the person is asleep or he's awake. I mean, there is no way for a human to label radio signals. So you have to invent new approaches that allow you to label these radio signals in an intelligent way without ask asking humans, without choosing workers. Another interesting thing is, of course, because labels are very expensive, because it's very hard to ask humans to label radio signals, and ideally you want to learn from unlabeled radio signals. Unlabeled radio signal is very cheap. I mean, you can put a radio receiver anyway, anywhere in, in the world and receive radio signals and learn from them, but they don't have labels. They are unlabeled radio signals. So one of the, the uh, problems and the challenges that we are working on and have most recent result on is how to uh, learn from unlabeled radio signal using something called contrastive learning. And contrastive learning is a technology that is used uh, typically in images and text, but the traditional contrastive learning does not apply to radio signals. So you have, again, to adapt it to radio signals. I talked about generalization to new domains, but I just touched the surface. Of course, generalization is a very, very big problem, domain generalization. And also, there are many interesting problems and advances that you can do and work on in that domain. And of course, I showed you results for a single individual, but we have techniques that we can address multiple individuals in the environment, and you have to adapt your neural network to separate signals from different individuals and address at the same time interference across individuals, which comes from like our understanding of interference in communications and infuse that information to your neural network so that it can operate on multiple individuals. So uh, I want to go back and show you some of our results in healthcare and also some of our more recent results. So here I, I'm going back to this early result that I showed you. This is actually one of our earliest results. And uh, here actually I showed you that we can track this per person and this red dot shows you where the person stands and how he walks. But one of the thing is uh, you see this person, you see this red dot, and uh, actually, let me stop it. So when, when you see this red dot, you know the location of the person. But in fact, just from the red dot, you don't know whether he's standing or sitting. Like uh, You have no information. You only know location. And when he moves, you see the red dot sliding. But you don't really know whether he's advancing with his right foot or left foot. All of that information is missing. So some of our recent results were to address these limitations. So let me show you some of our more recent results. Uh, so here I'm changing the, the frame. So the big frame here is uh, the output of the radio device. And the small uh, uh, image on the side is so that you can understand what is happening in the scene. So, uh, so this RGB video is just for your understanding and we are monitoring these people uh, through walls, and this is the, the big screen or the big frame is the output of the radio uh, system. So let me play this for you. So now you can see like when the person move and sits, for example, you know they are sitting. 
We are tracking a whole skeleton, not just a dot. And when he moves with his right foot, you see that. When he moves with his left foot, you see that. So we are getting a full skeleton, not only just a dot on, on a floor map. And all of that we can do with these advanced neural networks. Here you have more people. So as you can see, we can actually work with larger number of people uh, in the environment and track the motion of each individual separately and their full skeleton. Another thing that is interesting is to be able to track action, like not just what the person, uh, the skeleton, but really to be able to detect their action because you really want a system, as we said in the home, let's assume that you have someone who has Alzheimer or you are worried about somebody uh, who's really old, you want to have an understanding to provide the caregiver with understanding, did grandma uh, get breakfast? Uh, did she go to sleep? What is she doing now? But without having cameras in the home. So here what I'm showing you is a, a system that we developed that does uh, action recognition. So do you see the skeleton at the top? And the bottom video is just so that you can track the actual action. So here you're going to see that the person is going to imitate uh, combing their hair. And you see the skeleton is combing the hair. And in fact, the prediction is combing the hair. And you see uh, his immunity in drinking water. And you can see the skeleton drinks water. And you see the prediction get written. Uh, so his, his prediction says putting something in his pocket. Uh, he's pointing, uh, so you can see that also. And now he's picking up something. It's kicking. Yeah. So in uh, in the rest of the time, I want to show you more result in with actual patient in very important diseases. So over the last two years, we have been working very closely with uh, medical professionals, doctors, and uh, pharmaceutical uh, company, biotech industry. And we are looking at uh, monitoring diseases, monitoring patients, and informing the healthcare system. And we worked with patients in diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, some rare diseases like FSHD, uh, uh, immune diseases such as Crohn's, uh, and of course, uh, COPD, uh, uh, sorry, uh, of course, uh, like uh, COPD, which is pulmonary disease that I mentioned at the beginning. So, so this is just to visually understand how things look. This is actually our device. And just as you see, it sits on the wall uh, very much just like oversized uh, access point. You can think of it that way. It looks like an oversized access point. And uh, the person doesn't have to do anything. It's completely passive. So I'm going to show you some results and from few studies that we, uh, we are engaged in with our medical doctors. So the first result that I'm going to show you is from Parkinson's disease. And this is part of an NIH um, medical center. It's called the NIH Udall Center. And it is in collaboration with Dr. Ray Dorsey, University of Rochester Medical Center. So uh, first, let me show you a bit of an understanding of uh, some of our results. So here uh, I'm showing you this. Uh, we went in the study and deployed our devices with uh, 50 participants in this clinical study. And we have been deploying these devices with these participants for over a year now. Uh, we, we put, like you see, our Emerald device here is in green, uh, green rectangle that you can see. And you see this blue uh, line. This is actually about two hours of trajectory of the movement of this person. This is a Parkinson patient who happens to be living in an assisted living community. And uh, the, blue, the blue line just shows you a two hour trajectory of this particular individual. So we, as I said, we, we have deployed these devices in people's residencies, and we have been monitoring them for about a year, and we try to understand the results of the monitoring within the context of the disease. So let me first show you uh, some uh, visual results for this particular patient. So this graph is for the patient on the previous slide. So we took these trajectory that I showed you, <coughs> 
and we try to understand what the patient is doing throughout the day. So let me explain this graph. Every circle here is one day. So the innermost circle is the first day of the monitoring. The outermost circle is the last day of the monitoring. And on this graph, you see the result of two months of monitoring. So there are circles that uh, correspond to about uh, 60 days. So uh, zero at the top is midnight, 12 at the bottom is noon time. And what you see on this graph is different colors that correspond to what the patient is doing. So blue, for example, uh, correspond to uh, when the patient is asleep in bed. And as you can see at the beginning of the study, like the innermost circles, here the blue is very, very fragmented, it's very poor. So the sleep of this patient was very poor at the beginning of the study. As you go toward the outer circles, which are like the, the later days in this monitoring, uh, you see the blue starting to consolidate and is much better. So the sleep has improved drastically. Now, another thing that you see is green. You see green is all over the place. And green refers to the time when he is sitting on a chair. So he really likes to sit on this, on this chair. And as you can see here, most of his day is about sitting on a chair. So this is a very sedentary person. And that actually is very worrisome because people who are sedentary and just develop and uh, it, it leads to exacerbation of diseases. Another thing that you see is this yellow cone. So you see this yellow cone is around 8 a.m. in the morning. So it's between 6 and 9, as you can see. So this is 6 a.m., this is 9 a.m. This is this yellow cone here where I'm moving my cursor is 8 a.m. in the morning. And uh, when uh, my student and I looked at this graph, so yellow refers, as, as you can see here, to go into the bathroom to do his toileting and showering. When we looked at this graph, we were really surprised that this person just does his toileting and showering every day around 8 a.m., particularly like you see the blue. The blue, again, remember, is the sleep. So this person wakes up, the blue stops around 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning. So he wakes up around 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning, sits on a chair until 8 a.m., and then go to the bathroom to do his toileting and showering. Like in our mind was like, okay, so you wake up, you go and do your toileting and showering. Why would you sit on a chair until 8 a.m.? And then when the doctor looked at this, he was like, he was both surprised, but actually he, he knew exactly what was happening. So this patient is unable to do his toileting and showering on his own. Remember, he lives in assisted living community. And what happens is that the worker comes around 8 a.m. in the morning. And this is why he wakes up, he sits on a chair waiting for the worker. So immediately the doctor knows something that now he didn't know before, which is basically that this person is not able to do even the basic daily activity like showering and toileting. So that's not good. Another thing that you see is a cone of white between 17 and 18. So where I'm moving my cursor. So white refers to the time when the person is outside uh, our coverage area, our wireless coverage area. So when the person leaves their unit, uh, they are typically outside our coverage area, so you see white. So, uh, but what you see is that there is this cone of white between 17 and 18, uh, which is like 5 to 6 p.m. in the uh, in the evening. And so the person is always like between five to eight. Is this this is a time when they have dinner in the assisted living community, and he's very much interested in having dinner with the rest of the community. So he always leaves for dinner. But you see that there is one day here where I'm moving my cursor where he came back early because he wasn't feeling well. So now you also just completely passively understand their habit, their ritual, and change in these rituals that in many cases could be associated with bad health events. And again, remember all of this is with zero overhead to the patient or their caregiver, just by having a box that is smart wireless, a smart wireless box that sits in the background. Uh, as I told you, we are very much interested in relating these health metrics to the disease of the patient. So one of the things that we were working on is how can you, how can you understand Parkinson and the progression of the disease and the disease itself, the severity of the disease using these passive metrics? And so let me show you the next graph. So 
so we try to take our metrics. I told you gate speed is very important in the case of Parkinson. And we try to take these metrics and put them in the context of gold standard that doctor use for understanding the disease. So in the case of Parkinson, the gold standard is something called the MDSUPDRS, which is like a, a, a long test and battery of questions and tests that the clinician has to do. And it's only typically done when the person comes to the clinic. So you do it very occasionally, sometimes like once every six months, for example, or every year. In some cases, actually, there are Parkinson patients who, who never get to see a neurologist because they live in uh, a rural area away, for, away from medical centers. So can we get something that correlates well with this gold standard, but from our monitoring in home. So here what you see on the x-axis is this UPDRS. And um, UPDRS has two, uh, has something called part three, which is related to the motion part. And on the y-axis, you see our gait speed and every dot here is one patient. And you can see that uh, the severity of the UPDRS uh, is like increase the severity of the disease increases with increased uh, score on your PDRS. And as you can see, our measurement of gait speed very much correlate with the severity of the disease as measured with the gold standard. And uh, again, people use UPDRS in two forms. They use UPDRS part three, which is related to motion, but they use also UPDRS total, which is related to variety of aspects that are related to Parkinson's disease. And again, you see very high correlation, small p-value, which means statistically significant result. And again, we are measuring this at home. Uh, another thing that is really interesting to doctors is to look at response to medications. And I'm here, I'm just going to show you one very quick result. Uh, so, uh, in, like, we are looking at the response to medication in Parkinson patients. And in Parkinson, there is no drug that can uh, cure the disease. So the drug that you give to people uh, just manages the symptoms. So it stops the tremor, allows the people to move more freely. But it is very important to understand the impact of the drug on each patient because different patients may require different doses and also as the disease changes, the dose may need to change. But the doctor does not really know exactly how it impacts patient one versus patient two. So here what we do is we plot on the x-axis the time in the day. And you can see four refers to 4 a.m. in the morning. And this like whatever number here is the hour in the, in the day. And on the y-axis, we plot the gate speed. And let me show you this graph. So uh, this is a graph called box, box uh, uh, plot. Uh, so it is uh, the important thing is to look at the red line, which is the median of the gate speed at every single hour in the day. And you can see that the sweat plot actually is like having ups and downs. And so like what happens really is that the patient takes their first dose of medication when they wake up around 6.30 in the morning. And you can see their gait speed actually goes up because the medication impacts their symptoms. But at some point, like after about two hours, the gait speed starts going down. And what is happening is that the medication impact is wearing off. And this is why you see this, uh, this uh, the peak and then the valley. And then they take the second dose of medication. And then again, the gait starts going up again. And they are freely moving. But then after some point also, again, the, the impact of the medication wears off and the gait speed starts going down. So you see these peaks and valleys that correspond actually to when the medication is taken and how long the medication dose has uh, uh, affected the patient. And th something like this is very important for a doctor because they can understand whether the dose of medication is sufficient, when actually they need to increase the dose, when they need to decrease the dose for the patient so that they can maintain the best performance while uh, reducing the, the impact, the negative impact of the drug. I want to show you another uh, set of results. So we are working with uh, Dr. Brian Kim from Washington University Medical School on objective and sensitive uh, measures for chronic itch. 
So uh, chronic itch, uh, actually, so when we, when, we, when we have itch, most of us think of it as, okay, you scratch, and I mean, typically it's not a big deal, but imagine somebody who has chronic itch, who actually have uh, severe itching uh, that they need to scratch all the time. Typically, this is, this is actually very, very difficult disease. Uh, it impacts you. Like, and just imagine if you are scratching all the time, how difficult that is. One of the problem is that it's very hard to actually characterize uh, in an objective and sensitive way the amount of scratching or itching that the person has. So today they just have this scale of like zero to 10 and they ask the, pa the patient to rank the severity of their uh, itch on that scale. And somebody says seven, somebody says three, somebody says 10. But you can, you can imagine that this is very subjective. It's very hard to compare across patients. So one of the things that we did is we use machine learning and wireless signal to monitor nocturnal scratching. So uh, we, we trained the model. So here you see the model saying not scratching. And when the person does scratch, it says scratching. And uh, if the movement is he's moving but not scratching, it just says movement. And as you can see here, we have very accurate prediction. Uh, our recall and precision are both very close to 90%. So this is in the lab, and then with uh, Brian Kim, we actually took it and monitored actual chronic itch patients. And here we compared with a uh, camera, with infrared cameras in the patient's uh, in the patient bedroom, and uh, so we get people to annotate these videos. And on the x-axis, you see the annotation from the human just watching the video of people sleeping and scratching, and on the y-axis is our prediction. And this is like every dot here is one nine. So there are two 79s from 16 patients. And we are plotting the amount of scratching, the average amount of scratching per hour per night. And as you can see, there is very high accuracy in our prediction and the actual annotation from the video. But we can do it, of course, with the wireless signal, without cameras. Uh, and without having people watching and uh, trying to annotate scratching. And this is uh, another way to represent the result by looking at the AUC and the specificity and sensitivity. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you in a few minutes is we worked also with uh, Dr. Ipset Vahia from Harvard Medical School on monitoring COVID-19 recovery. So with COVID, uh, when, when somebody has COVID, particularly in the early stages when uh, the, the, like you, someone gets COVID and you tell them that they have to go and quarantine alone, and uh, if the symptoms get worse, they have to contact a doctor. But we were working with people in uh, like really old people, and when those old people quarantine alone, it's very worrisome because if something happens to them, they, they are old, some of them have dementia, so they might not know that the symptoms are escalating. So we were working on monitoring those patients using our wireless device and alerting the doctors and the caregiver. So here I'm showing you the respiration F1 patient. So you see on April 7, the breathing rate, on, and four days later, on April 11. So what happens when the patient recover, you see that the breathing rate becomes slower, like these, uh, the respiration, these ups and downs, the inhales, exhale are slower than uh, when, they, when they are like at the beginning of the disease, you get like much faster breathing. So reducing the breathing rate is one sign of good recovery. Another thing that happens when you, the patient recover is that their motion becomes much more agile. We all know that COVID is associated with really severe fatigue. So as the patient is recovering, with, which what you see here, like this is April 8 and this is April 11, and the green dot is the patient. And in both cases, she's moving from the chair to the bathroom, but you can see that she's much faster, more agile on April 11. So these are good signs of recovering.
But what, one of the things that we discovered in our monitoring that understanding respiration, understanding these metrics, particularly actual respiration, is very important to understand whether the patient is recovering properly or there are some problems with the recovery. So let me show you one example of a patient who went to rehospitalization. So here what you see, every one of these blue curves is a histogram of the breathing uh, rate on one day. So you see here, the first one is on April 8. And uh, what you see is that at the beginning, the patient uh, breathing rate was decreasing. So it was moving away from 20 breaths per minute closer to 15 breaths per minute. So the patient was recovering. And then on one day, the respiration rate jumped up. So the patient started breathing much faster. And indeed, on this day, the patient ended up in the hospital uh, for breathing problems. Uh, the patient stayed in the hospital for about one week. And after she came back, you can see that the breathing rate again started decreasing. And eventually, it went back to its baselines and the patient recovered. So what we see in our data is like three types of recovery that we can track through, through the respiration and the evolution of the respiration rate of the patient. So there are uh, patients who, whose recovery is problematic and can, can be not smooth, and that, like the one that I showed you, which ended up going to the hospital. And in that case, the breathing rate jumps at some point. And patients who are symptomatic, but their recovery is smooth, so you see the breathing rate gradually going back to its baseline. And then finally, there are asymptomatic patients that we all hear about, which are patients that do not have any symptoms. And as you can see here, their breathing rate stays the same when they are in, in um, uh, both when they are COVID positive, but eventually also the same as they become COVID negative. They have no symptoms. So this gets me to the end of my talk. What I presented to you is the collection of our work on using novel wireless devices. We call this device the Emerald device. And actually, it's um, what we imagine it is that it's the next move beyond the wearables. Of course, wearables enable so many interesting things, but we envision that the invisibles, like the ability to monitor health in a completely passive way, uh, is going to open many opportunities. I want to end with just one thing to say that, of course, when you can monitor people through wireless passively and through walls, it's very important to be sensitive to privacy issues, to security issues. And in all of our monitoring, we uh, actually, all of our tests, we are, are done uh, after getting IRB approvals for like that the experiment are ethical and we get informed consent. Basically, like, you have to explain to every participant and get their informed consent in addition to using, of course, the standard metrics about uh, encryption, anonymization, and all of that stuff. I'll stop here, and if there is any time left, I can take some questions. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, ma'am. I'm Himanshu Gandhi from IIT Delhi. I have a small basic question. Uh, in the device for monitoring sleep, we were seeing that there is a Wi-Fi device uh, which is uh, monitoring sleep of one uh, person. So if you want to monitor multiple people, would we need one device for each or a single uh, device can be used for multiple people? Yeah. So uh, as I uh, as I mentioned, our device works with multiple people. In fact, we have uh, a paper that we can monitor this, uh, the uh, respiration, and actually we do can monitor also the sleep of multiple people, even if they are in the same bed. All right. Thanks, Tina. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. That will be the last one. So thanks for the great talk. Uh, this is Bharadwaj from MIT. Uh, so my question is kind of, I think you touched upon this slightly towards the end. So I mean, this technology in the hands of the wrong person could lead to massive privacy uh, breaches. So uh, have you thought about ways of redesigning the air interface and the electromagnetic signals so that you can actually communicate, but 
make it difficult for an adversary to uh, track you and you know uh, find your breathing patterns and so on. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so there are multiple ways to do that. Of course, there are things at the signal level that you can do, but also there are things that are at um, that come from uh, computer science. So I'm sure all of you guys know about CAPTCHA, for example. In computer science, we have this way of challenge response. So I ch like when somebody shows you an image and asks you to, like they want to check whether you are a human or robot and ask you like what is in the image. So that's called challenge response. And one of the things that is our device is capable of because it understands space, you cannot just use, like you can add mechanism to uh, prevent the device from monitoring people against their will. Uh, because basically what the device can provide is a challenge response. Like let's say that I turn this device and I want to monitor my neighbor, then the device will say, okay, if this is if this is you, then why don't you take two steps to the right? Now take two steps to the left. Now turn in a circle. And if I, I if I not able to react to these challenges, then the device will say, okay, this doesn't seem to be you. Uh, I'm not going to give you this output. So this is one thing uh, from challenge response. Also, like to monitor space, the device can ask you to walk that space to, to prove that you have access to that space and not show you the results. So, so always in, in, in these kind of technology, I think you have also to develop the technology that allows you to preserve privacy. <coughs> but also at the same time, uh, work with the policies and as I said, like we work now with a lot of medical data and human subject experiments. And it's very important. It's very different, for example, from my work in, in a computer network. Now it's every experiment we have to get IRB approval to ensure that when you work with a human subject, the, the, the whole experiment is ethical and has um, uh, like um, have also informed consent. So both the technology, the policy, and the ethical considerations all have to be taken into account. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the audience. I know there are more questions, but uh, I'm hoping Dina can, <laughs> can feel some more email uh, later. Thank you so much, uh, Dina, for joining us and giving us this wonderful presentation. Uh, please give her a round of applause again. Uh, normally, at the end of uh, these keynotes, we uh, uh, we usually present a memento. Uh, but uh, since we are virtual here, we just decided to do an Amazon gift card instead. So that will find you in the email. So uh, so make sure that you look out for that. Thank you so much, Dina, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Swan. Thanks, everyone. Have a very nice evening. All right, Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And this concludes the program for today. I guess t tomorrow we start bright and early again uh, with a with a panel. Uh, thank you. Okay.